Well, good morning, church. It is great to be with you this morning. I'm Mike Bechtold. I'm the youth pastor, and it is a blessing to see everyone here this morning. Uh, We are jumping into another story that probably many of us have heard dozens and dozens of times. Maybe you remember hearing this story with the flannel graph in Sunday school and the teacher up, on the, up in front, or for me it was uh, in the old Superbook uh, TV show or whatever. If you've heard this story dozens and dozens of times, I invite you this morning to look at this story as this beautiful diamond that in the midst of viewing this story, as life goes on and as you see things from a different perspective, you're a little older and you're a little wiser, From the last time you've heard this story, you're slowly turning this diamond and looking at this beautiful story from a different perspective. And so I invite you to do that this morning. And if it's your first time hearing this story, awesome. Invite you to jump in with fresh eyes and see what God has to speak to you this morning. And so our story, I feel like we have to go back and just recap some of the highlights of Israel's story because it plays so much into the story of Daniel. And it starts with the Exodus that these people, the Hebrews, were enslaved under the Egyptians. They were, they were slaves and they were being t- forced to work and then finally God calls Moses to come and lead these people out. And uh, by God's power, they literally walked out of the front doors of this world power that was controlling a giant region of that area. They just walked right out the front doors by the power of God. And then they moved and they went, uh, they got God's law and then they started ending up taking over the land that God had been promising them since Abraham. And they've been talking about it for generation and generation about the land that God was giving them. And here they were under Joshua's leadership taking over this land city after city after city. And finally, they were able to settle. And after they settled, they began to, uh, during the period of the judges, just try to figure out how to do life with God. They had God's law. They had settled in their city. So let's, let's figure this out. And in the midst of that, they eventually got to a place where they said, you know what, we're, we're still missing something. And I think it's a king. You know, you look at all the countries around us, they all have kings. So we need a king. And so God replied, well, really, you're just rejecting me as your king. But fine, go ahead, have a king. And so they raise up Saul. Okay, and this was their opportunity to say, we did it. We are officially a nation in the eyes of the world. So attention was being drawn to this small country of Israel and the small people. And then, um, even though it turned out Saul ended up being a little bit of a psycho, uh, was able to move on then to David. And then after David came, Solomon. And Solomon was important for two reasons. One was because he was so wise. God had given him such wisdom. And other texts outside of Scripture talk about people going to visit Solomon and his infinite wisdom. So that was drawing attention again to this this new young nation. But then the other important thing that Solomon did was he built the temple. No more tabernacling. No more wandering. No more nomads. They were finally present. They had settled in this land, and now they've got the temple built. They built it in a place where you can basically see it all over Jerusalem. And it was this important place that told the world, not only are we present, but God is present. Yahweh dwells among us. The world could see that. And in spite of a divided monarchy... They were living the dream as being God's people of the promise. The promise that had been talked about for generations and generations, and this was it. They were the people living the promise. How exciting is that to be that generation? That is until the exile happened. First Assyria and then Babylon came in, and the story we talked about a few weeks ago focused specifically on Jerusalem and Babylon coming in, and the beautiful city of Jerusalem was destroyed, and their safety and security disappeared when the walls were ripped apart. I mean, the walls that protected them from outside armies and thieves and robbers just walking on in and doing whatever they wanted to the people was now gone. It was a pile of bricks just laid around the, around the city. People could just walk right in and do whatever they wanted. Other countries could walk right in and take over and kill and plunder and whatever. So they lost their safety and security. Then families were split apart, okay? The best, the strong, and the the brightest were taken away as slaves to Babylon while the weak and defenseless who already are uh, unsecure are left to defend themselves. And then probably the worst of it all for them would be to look up and see that temple destroyed, on fire, falling apart. The, The symbol 
that, talked, uh, that showed the world that Yahweh was among us and we are a present people here for permanently was gone. I mean, this once proud nation was back where they had started, like the Exodus, slaves in a foreign land. Can you imagine being that generation that lost it all? Can you imagine being the generation that lost it all? Where do you have hope? I mean, I remember a couple years ago, my cousins, they, uh, out at their house in the middle of the night, caught fire, and thankfully everybody got out. But standing there in their PJs, watching their house just completely crumble from the fire, and that, that hopelessness and devastation, and some of you can probably relate to it or know somebody who can relate to that, but you just feel so hopeless in that moment. You've lost everything. Imagine what that would be like for an entire nation, an entire people. So in the text, or in the, in the exile, our story that we're looking at here follows Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And for all you parents out there, you know them as Shadrach and Benny, right? Veggie tales. Um, and so these are some great stories in the book of Daniel as you see their rise to status with the Babylonian kings. But we also learn that these four were pretty much alone, at least from this perspective, that they were pretty much alone when it came to trusting God in this time. I mean, you see it in the first story in chapter 1 with their diet. And basically, Daniel and his three friends said, you know what, we don't, we don't agree with the food you're giving us because God says that this food is what we should eat. So we're going to eat this food, and you go ahead and feed them, and we're going to show you that God's ways is better and stronger and will make us better and stronger. And, sh- and so it did. And then that happened again a couple chapters later with the great story of the, the golden statue, and everybody had to bow down. And then Shaq, Rack, and Benny were standing there, and they said, no, we are not going to do that because God's ways are better, and we're going to stand for him. We are not going to bow down to this gold statue. When everyone else bowed down, they stood up and remained faithful in that moment. And so after a few other great stories after following that, we find Daniel now interacting with a new king, Darius. And so I invite you to join us in uh, Daniel chapter 6. Um, we're going to read through the entire story this morning. It's uh, 24 uh, verses. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, feel free to just kind of picture the story because it's a great story. So just kind of picture it in your mind and see the events unfold as we read through it. So Daniel chapter 6. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 providences, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each providence. The king also chose Daniel and two other administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, he, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was always faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius! You can already see the suck-up happening, right? Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators and officials and high officers, advisors and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into a den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed this law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room and its windows opened towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into a den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands, and it's an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. 
Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of his day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown in the dens of lions. The king said, May your God, whom you serve, so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed the stone with a royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace, and he spent all night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the, the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and he had them thrown in the lion's den along with their wives and children, and the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the den of the floor of the den. I don't remember that last part in the children's story. But um, I want to stop there because this is such a great story. And there, I want to focus specifically on two different perspectives in this story. One is on the focus from Daniel and his perspective, and then the other is from King Darius and what he is learning from this. And so from Daniel's point of view, we see this overarching theme, and actually the first couple chapters this overarching theme of staying faithful and trusting God in the midst of all oppression. Because we saw that with the battle of the diet, and they said, you know what, God's ways is better, so we're going to trust God in the midst of this. And then you saw that with uh, Shacharach and Benny before the fiery furnace, and they said, we're going to trust God in the midst of this moment, in the midst of this struggle we have before us. And now we see it with Daniel. They stood up for what they believed in. Their faith and their hope was in the Lord, and it was worth losing their life over. Okay, their hope in the Lord didn't mean that they were going to always prosper because if you were to go back a couple chapters to the fiery furnace story, when Shakrach and Benny stood in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, they basically said, you know what, we are not going to bow down and worship your idol because we have hope and trust in the Lord and we believe that he's going to save us. But then they also said, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't save us, know that we are not going to bow down to your, your idol. So this is understanding, because if it were me in that moment, my, my hope would have totally been in what I would have wanted to have happen there. My hope would have been something like, oh, I hope it rains so hard that it distinguishes that fire. Or I hope so much that the king is going to change his mind. My hope would have totally been in my wishful thinking, my own desires. But in these stories, their hope is in something greater. Something greater, their hope allowed them to move forward in spite of their situation, and they had this confident expectation of who God was. And because of this hope that they had, the hope that they expressed in these stories, they were hope in the midst of hopelessness. Okay, their people had lost everything, and they were back where they started as slaves in a foreign land. And so these four people were leaders when Israel had no leader. They brought hope, and they reminded their people, be hopeful, hope in the Lord, trust in the Lord in the midst of this situation. And maybe this is where you find yourself this morning, at a place where you need to be reminded to trust God in the midst of, of your situation, because we all find ourselves at some point in an exile, in some sort of exile in our life. Maybe you're forced to be far away from your family and friends that you love so dearly, or maybe you're finding yourself in an unsafe or insecure situation that's, uh, that's in front of you, or even the idea of just feeling distant from God, in exile from God. Daniel reminds us that when everything is at its worst, when everything is at its worst, 
trust in the Lord and have hope. So what areas in your life do you really find you need to trust God right now? Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe you've got some stuff going on in your family and you just don't know what to do and you just have to remember to trust in the Lord. Or maybe it's finances. Maybe, uh, maybe you've got some situations, some big bills coming up and you just don't know how you're going to pay for these bills and you just need to remember to trust in the Lord. Maybe it's your job. Maybe you recently got let go or you've been looking for a job for a while and you just need to remember to trust in the Lord. Or maybe if you're a student like me and you've got so many papers to write and not enough time to write them and you just need to remember to trust in the Lord. Or maybe if it's even your health. You heard some bad news from the doctor. And in the midst of that moment, you just need to remember to trust in the Lord. And as Daniel reminds us, in the midst of the exile, this is the most important time to trust in the Lord. Because it's easy to trust God when everything's great. It's easy to do that. But it's in the moments where we feel like we are in exile that we have to trust in the Lord because that's the moments that we remember that we need him most. And so where do you begin? I think Daniel said it perfectly, or actually expressed it perfectly, when he got down on his knees and he prayed. And he went before the Lord and reminded himself that he needs to go to God. So if you find yourself in exile this morning, if you find yourself needing to put trust into the Lord and something that's going on in your life, I invite you, we have some awesome people who come and stand over here just waiting to pray and lift up your prayer requests. And so I invite you after the service, if you need to put your trust in the Lord, come and let these people pray with you. Let that be an opportunity to pray and let God know that you really need him right now. So I invite you to do that after the service. And I don't want to push this aside. We're going to come back to this, but I want to look at the other perspective. The other perspective is in this, uh, from the situation is from King Darius. And it's interesting to note how much the other voices in the king's life so easily impacted his choices. I mean, to be fair, they were his advisors and, the, uh, and officials, but they so easily impacted the choices he made. He trusted those people who were close to him, and he trusted that they were there to make him better, to make him be the best king he could be. And what really happened was that he was manipulated and created a law that even he couldn't change. I mean, I can't fathom that. A king who rules the country and creates his own laws, and he can't change his own laws. That's how much power and authority that these officials and advisors had in the king's life. And this king soon learned that he had been listening to the wrong voices. He had been listening to the wrong voices, and he found that out because of the situation that happened with Daniel, and his heart broke when that happened. So my question for you is, what voices are impacting your choices? What voices are impacting your choices? For a lot of us, it's media. What you see on movies and on the TV, or even what you watch and interact with on Facebook and Twitter, those things impact how we live and what we say and what we do and what we wear. So what voices in there are impacting your choices? Maybe it's your coworkers and neighbors, those people you're constantly doing life around and you maybe not even interact with, but you sit in the cubicle next to them or you bump into them at the coffee shop. They impact you as well. The way they do life and the way that they act and the things they say in those moments impact your voices sometimes, or impact your choices sometimes. For a lot of us, it is definitely family and friends. Those people who are closest to us, that we are constantly doing life with, that we are constantly interacting with, they are always impacting our choices. And so recognize who are the voices that impact your choices. And then the second question I have for you is, are they the right voices? Are they the right voices? Are they voices that encourage and build you up? Or are they voices that manipulate and tear you down? I mean, I see this in youth ministry all the time, constantly asking the questions, who should you hang out with? What should you wear? How should you act? Is this right or is this wrong? I see this all the time. Students are wrestling with this. And the interesting thing is, is when you become an adult, it doesn't get any easier, right? It doesn't get any easier. You have to ask, what voices are speaking into my life at this moment, and are they the right voices? And sometimes it might mean you have to walk away from some voices, 
Sometimes there's a voice that is totally manipulating and tearing you down, and you need to get out of that situation. And sometimes that means you need to surround yourself with the right voices. Maybe, maybe you need to be around some voices that constantly are building you up and making you be the best you can be for God. That might even mean intentionally going and asking somebody to be your mentor. That's what I love about our confirmation program, is that we've got these adults who are a little older and a little wiser who is spending time on a regular basis with our youth. And they're not trying to tell them how to live life, and they're not trying to tell them this is how you have to act, but they're helping them be the best they can be for God. And I love that picture. It's such a beautiful picture. So what voices are impacting your choices, and are they the right voices? But it's also important to notice the other side of that coin, that while there are voices that impact our choices, we are a voice that impact the choices of others. How we live for the Lord and the voice we become will impact the choices that other people make around us. Okay, our story isn't officially over yet, because Daniel was still a voice. So if you jump back into the text, verse 25, it reads this. Then King Darius sent out this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom, which is really saying, I'm doing this, so you should also do this. Everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people, and he performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He had rescued Daniel from the lion's mouth. So Daniel and his voice not only impacted the king, because it's obvious the king had become attached to Daniel and his, the way he spoke into the king's life, but this voice also impacted the world because that message went out to the whole world. And here's what's even more interesting. In the midst of Daniel's exile, he was still a voice. So if you're somebody who's finding yourself in exile this morning, remember you still have a voice. We always have a voice in other people's lives. How we handle situations, how you interact with your wife and husband, and how you interact with your kids and your other family members, and how you interact with your coworkers and the, co- the guy at the coffee shop or the checkout lane at the, at the grocery store. You still have a voice no matter where you are at in life. And so my question for you is to be thinking about who are you influencing? Who are you influencing What voices are you speaking into other people's lives? Because when you encounter others, are you being the right voice? Now this question is going opposite of, do you have the right voices speaking into you? But then the other question is, are you being the right voice to other people? Are you being a right voice that encourages them and builds them up to be the best they can be for God? Or are you finding yourself manipulating and tearing them down? And that's a difficult question to ask yourself, especially since naturally we are wired to do what's best for us. And that might mean we unintentionally manipulate other people and tear them down because it makes us better, makes us feel better about ourselves, or it makes us put ourselves in a situation that is better. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to encourage and build others up, and we have to make an intentional choice to do that for everybody around us, including our enemies. We have to be intentional about that. And that right voice, as Daniel reminds us, is a voice that points others to an amazing God. Our voice should always point others to an amazing God. So in closing, the three areas I want us to focus on is, do you find yourself in exile this morning and really need to trust God in this next season? If that's you, I invite you this morning to come and pray after the service. Come lift these prayer requests up to the Lord and put your trust. Call out to God and say, God, I need you right now. So I invite you to do that this morning. Secondly, what voices are impacting your choices? And are they the right voices? Do you need to go and get the right voices in your life? And then finally, who are you influencing? Are you being the right voice that builds others up and points them towards Christ? Let me pray.